we'll get started in just a moment here. Um, as, as you're coming in, before I introduce our first presenters, um, I'm Rob Lansfield. I can claim no credit for this session. I am just here to keep things running on time. I did want to note that although the two presentations that are happening in this room uh, right now and half an hour from now are listed completely separately in the program, there is some really great um, topical intersection overlap um, that if you are interested in this one that's about to happen, you may well want to uh, stick around if you weren't already planning to for the one following it because there may be some uh, great crossover discussion at some point at the end. That said, it's about time to get going. So we will first hear from Sina Baram, Susan Chun, Anna Lavatelli. Uh, their details are in the program, so I'll just say this is sharing the stories that images tell, coyote and accessibility at the MCA. Okay. There's my head of digital. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, oh, Got all the energy that I spent last night warning people not to try to hire you. Oh, no. I, really? There we go. I'm doing the job for you. <laughs> Don't trust me. I'm going to come back. I just wanted to be able to see it. Just put it full there. There we go, got it. Is that a slide? That's a slide. Woohoo! I'm, I'm going to stand for just a moment because I can't otherwise see the deck. Um, so, uh, hi everybody, welcome. Um, it is uh, lovely to see so many old friends in the audience. We're really excited to um, share the story of Coyote with you. We're going to be speaking really quickly today because we have half an hour um, and we're gonna try to, to, to make time, um, but we have a lot to tell you. So um, we're gonna jump right in. Um, I, Anna, can you, can you do keyboard? Because I can't reach. Um, okay, so uh, Coyote, which is the project that we're going to be talking about, um, I wanted to make clear is in fact part of a much larger accessibility initiative that um, began at the MCA um, in the year of the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disability Act. Disabilities Act. Um, the museum made a big commitment to actually looking at um, its accessibility policies and uh, and activities in all areas of our practice. So in the galleries, in our education programs, um, in our publishing programs, um, as well as on the web. Um, but we and we built a three-year um, project plan that. I'm happy to share with any of you because we're kind of proud of it um, and wrote a manifesto um, uh, that included a lot of different things um, and was vetted uh, fairly recently by administration. So um, one of the aspects of that and one of the ones that has actually um, gotten the most attention in this community is the Coyote Project. Um, which sprang out of work that we were doing on um, launching a brand new website um, and kind of doubling down, committing to trying to be as fully accessible as possible. Um, at the time, we thought that we had a long way to go to catch up to the whole world of museums where everybody, in fact, was probably completely accessible on their websites. So we. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's what we found out. Um, um, by that time, we had already sort of committed. We'd hired Sina um, and um, had really started down a path of uh, building a new site that um, would be as close as possible to compliant with the WCAG standards um, for accessibility as uh, it could be. Um, we, uh, I think, worked very, very quickly and uh, effectively um, thanks to Sina, and about halfway through the process of, of um, developing our specification, Sina called 
um, called me on the telephone and said, you know, there's a thing I haven't been telling you. Um, and the thing is, since you say that you want to um, be so accessible, uh, if you really, really, really want to win accessibility, you have to describe every image on your website. And <laughs> we said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, obviously, you know, not being able to see an image is, is, is a problem for people who, have, who are vision impaired. You will need to, to describe every image on your site. And I said, well, 10,000 images is a lot of images to describe. And, um, and, and you know, like most museums, um, like most museum professionals, my response was, we're not going to be able to do that. Um, but we took a, took a couple of days and thought about it, and we kicked it around a little with Sina, and ultimately decided that we were going to try to do it. Um, we, tr we, we decided to try to do it for a lot of reasons, not least of which is that Sina had become a friend of ours and, and had really told us um, some some good stories about what it means to be blind in a museum and to be blind on a museum website, how he navigates a site, and really what our site gives him, um, if, if not images. Because, of course, like most museums, we have a site that tells its stories mostly in images. So, uh, Asina, you want to? Sure. Yeah, sure. So, um, essentially, there's a, there's a few things. Uh, the, the way someone uh, who is blind or vision impaired, and, and, and I, I will preface this with a lot of the things that we're talking about here today, while we're concentrating on visual description, have a lot of benefit for a great deal of other uh, folks from cognitive disabilities um, and, and, and so forth. Um, but the way someone who's blind or low vision uses a computer typically is uh, through uh, something called a screen reader. It's a, it's a software program. Um, it exists on most mainstream PCs, your Mac has it built in, every Apple product actually has it built in. I've got an iPhone in my hand that I'll hold up to the microphone here. Um, you won't be able to see what is on the screen, um, join the club. Um, and so to that end, okay, let me, there, do that. Right. 50%. Good enough. And so really quick, just to uh, demonstrate, when I touch something, news, vision folder, games folder, 17 apps. Hmm. Okay. And double it, tap to open. Gives you some instructions. Double, double taps to activate, double tap to activate, things of this nature. So you can use gestures and other uh, similar things of how you might use an iPhone, but I use it in a way that it reads what is underneath my finger first, and then I know, oh, I want to go to that. Okay, I can double tap. And the only difference really being that I tend to be a little bit more comfortable at this speed. But it's exactly the same content, just pronounced a little louder, uh, pronounced a little faster. And so a screen reader technology like that is, um, is, is the primary mechanism through which uh, I, I use a computer or, or a website in this case. And so when you are on a museum website or, or any website that might not be uh, terribly accessible, one of the things that you quickly find is that uh, images are used as the basis of conveying information, conveying aesthetic, but also uh, for navigation purposes. So you, you click on something to go somewhere, uh, whether it's a, a link or a button, whatever the case may be. And so if you hear um, um, a, a link or, or, or a navigation control that says, you know, contact us, it's very clear. Okay, great, I can go there. However, if you hear something that says, um, you know, Z1XX3347758ACC.jpg, it's not incredibly informative, right? And actually can really be rather, rather frustrating. And so that is um, the, the, the thing that we were trying to, to, to change, is to send a signal that by coming to a website and having it be accessible and having these visual descriptions, which previously are not in any way um, you know, conveyed for most institutions, be available to uh, screen reader users, it's an incredibly um, valuable experience. So um, many of you are familiar with um, with alt text and and the kinds of descriptions that um, that are placed uh, in a website to describe an image, um, and and so for example, this is a picture of a painting in our recent Carrie James Marshall exhibition. Um, its alt text uh, is. Um, a painting of an African-American woman holding a paintbrush and palette while standing in front of a paint-by-numbers self-portrait. Um, Sina and I have a, an ongoing dispute about whether that's actually way too long. Um, 
and and we'll talk a little about you know the ways that standards emerge out of this kind of work. Um, we we also um, in the work that we did together in the months following our decision to go ahead and try to create um, visual descriptions for our site, um, started to work much more with long descriptions, which are much more comprehensive, much longer descriptions, um, that seem much more appropriate for, in many cases, for the kinds of works in, that, are, that are resident on our website. And so I wanted to read you guys a long description um, that was authored by one of our curators. We'll talk about that too. Um, but I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes um, before I start, except for those of you who are in fact um, uh, we'll, we'll struggle to hear, um, in which case you can follow along. Um, we'll put the description up. But the rest of you close your eyes, and I'm going to know if you're cheating. So, okay? Um, ready? This is an installation that viewers are invited to walk inside of. From this viewpoint, you are looking through a doorway at a slight distance, as if standing inside of a large cave and looking out at its narrow entrance at the world outside. The walls of the cave are alternating stripes of red, white, and blue material that seem to be made of some kind of thin fabric. These colored stripes spiral around toward the entrance as if being sucked out of the opening. The inside of the cave is more shadowed and the area outside brightly lit. Gradually, you notice that there are in fact two openings lined up in front of each other straight ahead of you. The first, a tall rectangle, the red, white, and blue fabric is wrapped through the edges of a standard doorway. Beyond that, beyond that, it continues to spiral around toward another circular opening. The center of this circle is much brighter, as if one had finally escaped from the cave. At the center of that circular opening, you see two large white fans facing your direction, blowing air into the cave-like opening. Beyond the fans, you see a brown square form, which is the bottom of a huge wicker basket. This basket, lying on its side, helps to reveal the truth about what you are seeing. You are standing inside of a huge hot air balloon, which is lying on its side. Blown by fans, the fabric billows out to press out against the existing walls of a large room, the malleable shape of the balloon conforming to the rectangular surfaces of an existing building, the gallery that contains it. Okay. Um, so here's the image. Um, and we hope it looks a little like you might have pictured. Um, the, the interesting thing about this is in many ways breaks all the rules of description that Sina taught us when we, when we first started to, um, to, to practice. Um, and yet it is, I think, a sort of lovely little narrative and we have, a, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds of examples of, of such narratives. We've really, go ahead. Well, yeah, I was just gonna draw one extension. So, so it, it's actually, I mean, it follows every single rule from a, from a long description point of view. It was just that, um, I think the distinction you were trying to make was between alt text, you know, traditionally being very short, uh, and the description that you just gave, that the narrative, that, that, that just the story that was told there, which was a lot uh, more akin to um, a, a long description, which is how we're using it on the website. Well, and also sort of, you know, uh, what do you see, what, what is it you are seeing yeah. first? Because we built to a, to a, to a surprise in theory. Um, Uh, I wanted, uh, we want to to spend some time because in fact most of the time when we tell people that we're doing this work, uh, folks say, oh that seems like a really good idea, not something for my institution because it is going to be way too hard, way too expensive, thousand reasons why it can't be done and so we really want Anna to spend some time talking about how we did it. We did it in a very short time with nearly no money um, and um, have, have have really the very strong feeling that we will continue to do it on an ongoing basis. So I'm just gonna walk you through some of that. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so how do we do this? Um, I First, the, the software itself. Um, managing the description of 10,000 images um, really required something to aid us in that workflow and also to develop our own guidelines for the uh, museum. And so, um, the first thing was working with Sina very closely to um, build this software called Coyote. Um, what you're seeing is a screenshot 
of um, the welcome page uh, from the admin side, you'll see that the first thing you see are stats so that we know where, how we're doing, um, how many descriptions we still need to approve, um, because we do have a workflow where anyone in the museum can describe, but it goes through um, to um, the editorial team um, so that they can see what images are not assigned yet and need to be assigned to people. Um, they, they can review the descriptions. You'll see these yellow tags that say ready to review um, with the description uh, underneath the image um, as well as the caption from the website. Um, so this software integrates um, with the MCA website so that the website is talking to Coyote and Coyote is talking to the website. Coyote pulls the image and the caption from our website, serves it up um, to our team of users in the museum so that they can write descriptions, uh, they can riff off of each other's descriptions, and then once those are approved by editorial, it gets sent back to the website and served up as alt text. And so um, an image page, you'll be able to see all the various descriptions, both long and alt. Um, you can view, you can edit uh, as an admin or um, as a describer, you could describe again. Um, so we can harvest multiple descriptions and grow and learn and build on each other's work. Um, and so uh, this is a screenshot of the description page. You can see, um, in addition to long and alt, um, there's also locale. Um, the hope is to support multiple languages um, as the project continues to grow. So um, clearly, we need people working in the software. So the next step of how we do this is getting a team of people in the museum to learn how to describe together. Um, so we started out um, as we were building our website um, at the Web Sprints, uh, working with Sina to train staff from across the institution, from visitor services to curatorial education, development, everybody uh, coming together and learning together, um, working in pairs, uh, having conversations, asking difficult questions, getting Cena on the phone on, uh, on Skype to, so that everyone could read descriptions and, and find out what they were missing. And, um, and this is a photo of the group on the stage of uh, the MCA uh, theater, um, all working away furiously on laptops um, together as we were <laughs> both launching our website and trying to describe 10,000 images. And, and that first mm -hmm. one yielded, three, I think that first sprint yielded 300 plus descriptions, like just that first, uh, yeah. that first sprint did, right? Yeah. Okay. And then our, our second sprint, I think we did another 500 more. Um, what we do is we put our stats up and I refresh the page every minute so that people can see the numbers ticking up. Um, so it becomes uh, sort of competitive. You can see your personal stats so that you can um, try and do a personal best uh, and outdoing uh, your colleagues. Um, but of course, um, you know, as Susan started um, the talk, it, it also we needed the support of the MCA leadership, and um, we really um, have have come such a far way in less than a year. It's really amazing. Um, we we were so pleased to change our first slide. We were working from a previous presentation. We realized, oh, we we have developed a three-year plan. It's not that we will. <laughs> so we're we're making progress. Um, and of course, the last thing is involving constituents in the process, right? We need to know how we're doing. And I kind of spoke to that a little bit, but I think Sina can expand on that process of talking with our colleagues. So there's a lot of different things that come into play when talking about collaborating on accessibility or, or really any specialty uh, uh, topic. One is expertise, expert advice, consulting, that sort of thing. The other one is uh, usability testing involving participants and, and, and co-designing um, with them. So to that end, um, uh, the MCA, uh, when um, I think it was t uh, one or two trips ago, um, the there was an accessibility meetup in town, and these are meetups that are held um, uh, around the United States, around the world, actually. Usually once a month, once every couple of months, we hold one in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, where I live, and it's people that get together that are interested in digital accessibility or physical accessibility. So MCA hosted one and invited um, the the community to come in, and and we talked about Coyote had a really honest. Um, 
just sincere discussion about some of these issues and talking about why are we even bothering to do this project? What's the, you know, what's the point of this stuff? What, uh, what, you know, what aspects would be uh, better to explore? And that uh, feedback is not a, a one-time uh, visit, but something that's part of an iterative cycle. Uh, and something that's part of an iterative cycle that grows. So involving other uh, individuals that have interests ranging from visual description, uh, just from an art history point of view or from an art point of view, to accessibility and inclusive design, as well as looking at the technical ways of doing this so that it's available for everyone. And I, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But making sure that this is not something that is just for someone who is blind or low vision, realizing that these descriptions have advantages for all visitors to the museum. Um. The question that we are asked um, pretty much all the time is a question about standards. What are the rules that we follow? Um, Sina started our training by uh, walking us through the Art Beyond Sight guidelines, which I think we, we can highly, highly recommend. We use them in the workshop that we taught on Tuesday. Um, they're really, really worth spending some time with. Um, but they are not the end of the road. I think that our feeling very much is that description is something that is going to be developed um, at the institutional level, that it will represent an institutional voice, and that methods and rules and guidelines um, will, will develop out of doing the work. Um, we feel really, really strongly that um, it is in building a community of other institutions that are doing description that we will raise and surface um, both problems and solutions. And so one of the things that we've been you know, doing for the last year is actually talking to colleagues and saying, you know, we need you in this too, because it really cannot just be the MCA you know, uh, thinking about what you say about uh, somebody's skin color. Uh, in a description, or you know how you deal with um, tawdry topics um, in in paintings. So, so we're really we're we're very very interested in the ways that uh, standards emerge out of actual practice. Um, and one of the things that we did that was really important mm -hmm. on a, yeah. was the software being um, also a tool for learning. Um, so as as I sort of walked you through those screenshots. Um, all of the users can see each other's descriptions. Um, we can um, look at whose descriptions are approved. We can also look at the audit log on a description to see how editorial has changed them so that um, a user who maybe has not been writing in full sentences realizes, oh, I should probably start using punctuation when I describe. Um, so so we're, we've been working together to develop our own standards for the MCA description and learning from each other with the software. Uh, we did a workshop on Tuesday, and one of the interesting things that we did was, I'm not going to read this because we are running out of time, but we, um, we gave everybody uh, Mardi Gras masks to describe, first thing. Um, it was kind of nice to remind folks that, you know, when you are describing, and you're often doing it from images, that in fact you're often describing, you know, real you know, three-dimensional objects um, that, you know, that, that, you know, are tangible, that you can touch, that have dimension. Um, it was interesting to us how very similar the descriptions were um, and, and, and charming and, you know, and, and smart and, you know, thoughtful um, right off the bat. And uh, I think it is, it, it, it is a signal to us that, that all kinds of people can actually describe. Um, so... So um, I wanted to talk a little about um, why, why we're doing this. Um, as, Anna, as Anna pointed out, we're asked a lot, um, you know, how many blind people really are there in Chicago? Um, and, you know, how does this really, really matter to the institution when we have so many other priorities? Um, we're doing it because we're, we, you know, because ADA um, and WCAG standards actually actually suggest you should. We're doing it mostly, though, because it is the right thing to do. Um, we feel that um, more than anything, uh, making our site accessible, inviting the community of people with uh, vision impairment 
uh, and blindness to be a part of our work sends a, a welcoming signal that says, we believe that the creative community is absolutely anybody. It is, if, if it is um, blind people, then you can bet that, you know, we think that, you know, you ought to be, you ought to be a part of, you know, what we do. One of the things that, um, our director recognized almost immediately was that there are lots of people who feel disenfranchised in a museum. Um, there are tons of people who feel um, confused and at sea in a contemporary art space. And that in a lot of ways, these descriptions kind of help um, more people than just people with vision impairment. Um, we've ourselves very much learned from describing um, uh, uh, amongst our team, our curators, um, who who, when you ask them to try to write something that uh, is jargon-free, that assumes that a visitor may have no a priori knowledge, um, you know, blow you off as if you know all of those people who haven't got art history training are just stupid. Um, when you ask them to write something, um, assuming that somebody who is blind has no a priori knowledge of painting or art, or art. Um, they suddenly become empathetic. I mean, it's amazing. The Coyote tool, I think, is a is a is a box of empathy, um, and we've been we've been we've been super excited to see that. Um, and it also creates a, a a kind of collaboration across departments that um, I hadn't seen before. So li so watching curators and educators listen to visitor services staff say, folks really don't understand this work. They don't know what it's about. They don't know, you know. Even you know, even how it's made um, has been has been exciting for us. We are almost out of time, so I think that we wanted to. We just wanted to quickly discuss where this can go. Yep. Okay. So um, this has a lot of uh, possibilities because once you realize that your descriptions are available to be um, uh, delivered for the web or for mobile or for digital interactives, uh, the, the 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 sky is the limit. A few things that. Um, uh, are, are easily come to mind is obviously a mobile tour or uh, feeding into an app that is consolidating, uh, you know, location information and feeding descriptions. These really rich, augmented uh, descriptions um, uh, to you as you're walking through uh, the, uh, the museum. So having that experiential augmentation, but then also going to things like uh, electronic publications when when creating a digital asset, drawing upon this uh, database of descriptions and putting it in and realizing that Coyote is, is context aware. We didn't get to talk about that a lot, but different descriptions can exist for different contexts. So you can have a different description for mobile versus a digital interactive versus when it's inserted in a book versus when it's served on the website, which adds a, a layer of nuance that I think is missing from a lot of uh, accessibility when it comes to images. Um, some things that are already uh, in the works and being implemented, one of the things we worked on in the workshop is the, this bookmarklet. So this idea of, without getting into the technical details, especially given our, our, our time is that Coyote is a server right now. You you stand it up and you um, uh, it, it knows about the images on the on the website and you you author descriptions like Anna showed. However, if that sounds like a lot of work in terms of getting IT involved and uh, technology write-offs involved. Then another approach is that there is a bookmarklet you can run. We have a public instance of Coyote uh, running on the web, and it allows you to describe the images on any website by running the bookmarklet and authoring those descriptions. And then someone else can come along, and if they run that same bookmarklet, those in, those descriptions, those amazing uh, uh, you know uh, descriptions that have been written by by anybody, uh, will be realized. They'll be injected into the page, and so I can come along to, uh, let's say, the Google website, and they had a Halloween doodle up on the 31st, and Anna and Susan wrote descriptions of that, and I was able to uh, read those descriptions of that image, even though Google had not described it past uh, Halloween.gif or whatever it was. Um, so, so we are out of time. Um, we have, we actually have a, a, a ton more stuff that we would love to share with any of you who are uh, interested in continuing this conversation. Um, we've actually developed um, a, 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 a way to publicly expose the long descriptions that you've seen because we've had so much uh, demand for them. Um, so please be in touch. Um, the software uh, is uh, open source and uh, pretty much mm, almost available. <laughs> <laughs> um, for you guys to download and play around with. Um, and um, we would love to hear from you. I don't think we have time for questions, but. Thank you.